Faces are wonderful objects that we're able to recognize. When you think about a face, we all have two eyes, a nose, a mouth, uh, and they're arranged in the same configuration. And so from a kind of perceptual standpoint, all faces are very similar, and yet the um, visual system is able to individuate, to discern differences between a face, uh, maybe of, a, of your friend versus your mother, uh, in a split second. So whatever is going on, we know that the, the face recognition system is highly tuned to individuating faces. And it's so it must be sensitive to subtle shapes in the in our facial features, or maybe the spatial distances, or maybe the texture. Uh, and we know from the very beginning, from, from birth, uh, neonates come out of the womb uh, attending to faces, that they've done work with um, uh, infants 30 minutes old, and they'll show a, a geometric shape that looks either like a face or, or a scrambled face, and the infant will attend to the face-like configuration over a scrambled configuration. And then by uh, two days, it's able to individuate the face of his or her mom over the um, uh, face of a stranger. So somehow we're biologically hardwired to look at and attend to faces over other objects. Uh, and it makes complete sense from an evolutionary standpoint. It's, a, it's our, our mother, it's our uh, other people in our family that give us uh, nourishment, that give us social support. So it seems like faces, if you had to pick one object that you'd want to recognize at this very specific level, faces are the best candidate. Uh, this is obvious, but uh, faces carry a wealth of information about who we are, what we're feeling, and what we're thinking. So if you think about the face as an object, it's a very robust ob object in terms of the kinds of information it provides to the observer. So it, just looking at a face in a split second, we, um, we will know the identity of the face, we will know the expression of the face, and we also can interpret eye gaze and have a sense of what that person is thinking or feeling. So these are all things that we, we get from a face in a, in, in a, in a split second. So uh, we don't have to go to school to learn how to read faces. This just seems like something that we uh, uh, acquire quite naturally and very quickly and very early on in our development. So because of this, because we have this exquisite ability to perceive and distinguish di uh, different sources of information in a face, it's been claimed that most of us are uh, face experts. That is, uh, if you think about other kinds of expertise that people might have, maybe for birds. Actually, in our lab, we study bird experts. Um, it's that same sort of highly tuned perceptual ability um, that we, most of us, bring to bear when looking at faces. Where it's been shown that most of us are face experts, and this is where I, I, I get, um, uh, came interested in the autism um, literature and research is that it turns out kids with autism are not so good at the faces. They're in fact what you can consider as face novices. That is, there's been uh, now lots of work showing that um, kids uh, on the spectrum spend significantly less time looking at uh, faces and also most in the eyes. I think that this is kind of, there's lots, lots of really you know, solid research show, showing that kids on the spectrum have what's called eye avoidance. Not only do individuals on the spectrum uh, attend less to faces, they have some deficits in recognizing facial identity. So just as I said that the kind, um, in, we get different kinds of information from a face, one of the really critical aspects of, of faces is they tell us who we are and who other people are. So it's by our face that we uh, gleam uh, and access people's identity. Um, and obviously that's critical for social interactions. You have to be able to identify the person you're interacting with if you don't remember who they are or you can't make that connection to their identity. 
there's going to be some, you know, uh, some severe social deficits. You know, you've, we've all heard of people who are considered face blind as prosopagnosia, that do brain damage, or they're not able to recognize faces. Well, these individuals, I mean, one of the, the besides not being able to recognize faces, they, um, uh, they struggle with their social interactions as well. Okay, so um, um, individuals with autism have problems recognizing uh, faces, uh, the identity of faces. Uh, not surprisingly, they, are, um, um, they have difficulty interpreting facial expressions. Okay, so not only knowing who the, to whom the face belongs, but also knowing um, um, what emotional state that person is. That is, we so kind of carry or convey our feelings through our facial expressions, or at least the feelings, the emotions we like to present others. So being able to uh, interpret somebody's facial expression is really, really important. And the facial expressions are really kind of interesting from a perceptual standpoint because it's very dynamic information. Unlike identity where we're always the same person, no matter you know, what viewpoint you see me or uh, whatever, but the, our facial expressions are very these kind of fleeting moments in time where we might flash a smile or, or, or smirk, but these um, facial emotions are only on the face for a split second. There's been um, a lot of um, really great work in eye tracking with kids on the spectrum, individuals on the spectrum. This is the kind of classic work by Ami Klin, uh, where um, Ami showed a um, uh, a, a video snippet uh, from the movie Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf. This is a really intense movie where lots of drama, lots of uh, interactions going on between people. And he had um, um, individuals uh, on the spectrum and typically uh, developing individuals um, look at this movie and he's tracking their eye movements. Um, this, uh, what you see in uh, yellow, is the eye movements of uh, typically developing individuals. Notice that it's very much focused on the face and very much focused on the eyes of the individuals as they're having this intense dialogue. Uh, the red indicates the eye movements of um, individuals on the spectrum, and it's very, very different in that uh, it, it tends to wander more towards the objects or lower part of the body. If it does go to the face, if the eyes do go to the face, it's more in the mouth area. So um, very different sort of pattern of eye movements for people on the spectrum. And this is important because where we look is often gives us really good clues to what we're attending to. Um, so that um, from this we can infer that um, uh, individuals on the spectrum are not really uh, uh, attending to the face and not really in attending to the eyes. And, and, and the eyes, we said the, the face is important as a carrier of uh, emotional information, but also in, in the face it's the eyes that really tell us a lot about what somebody's feeling or where, where somebody's looking. So the eyes are really an important source of information in the face. Um, I've just highlighted this is the percentage of time um, people spend looking at different areas of the face. The key result here is the normal controls are spending 65% of their time looking at the eyes, uh, where the uh, autism group's only spending 25% of their time looking at the eyes, where the autism group is look, spending about 41% of the time looking at the mouth. Um, where the normal control is only 21%. So again, you see this kind of bias. There's been a lot of work now in brain imaging. Um, the early work, um, uh, the seminal work was done by Bob Schultz. So here's the brain, and then you can take like a horizontal slice of the brain and look at different brain um, activations in different areas. So this is the control group, and then this uh, orangish area here you can see, uh, is the fusiform face area, and you can see by the red uh, blotches that indicates uh, uh, increased activity so that um, the control group um, shows the normal face response. Um, 
people on the spectrum, when they look at faces, so this again highlights the fusiform area, it doesn't show the typical face response when looking at faces. In fact, the area more what's called lateral or to the side of that face area seems to be active. Um, um, it's been speculated that this area is more related to object processing. If, if, if individuals with autism have difficulty recognizing faces, what exactly is going wrong or what's, what's being compromised from a cognitive standpoint? What are the mechanisms that are being um, uh, sort of uh, affected? Um, because you want to know that if you have any hopes of developing um, effective interventions. Um, so that's what um, we sort of set out to do um, <laughs> with, uh, this is a, a study with the Yale Child Study Center um, <clears throat> where we put together what we call the Let's Face It uh, test battery. So a lot of these measures came out of our labs or the labs of my colleagues because we have a, actually, you know, um, from a cognitive standpoint, we pretty much, we have a pretty good handle on how people recognize faces, how sort of the, sort of the normative uh, uh, face recognition system works from a cognitive standpoint. We know sort of the sort of underlying mental operations involved in recognizing faces. So from that we could develop a reasonable battery. So we, so we put together a bunch of these tests and, and we had uh, found different places where um, um, individuals on the spectrum um, struggle and, and this, uh, with this particular cohort it was with um, younger kids, uh, let's say eight to like uh, 16, so it was, it was um, young adults and children. Um, so um, and this is called the matchmaker identity test. So basically what happens is you're given a study face here, so you're asked to look at that face and then it's, you simply have to figure out which uh, face matches the study face of the three probe faces, okay? And so, you know, th this is a kind of recognition that we do all the time in, in, in recognizing in faces. That is, it's really important f for us to be able to recognize the same person across changes in expression. So, so here we have a, a person smiling and then different people with different emotions. Well, this is the same person except with a different facial expression, right? So, um, what we have to be able to do is recognize the same person despite changes in their uh, uh, emotional state. Uh, similarly, we have to be able to recognize people despite changes in, in viewpoint. So here's the steady face and you have to pick the face that goes with this particular uh, face despite changes in um, perspective. And um, I think it's this one here. It's not the easiest test, actually. We said that you have to recognize the same person across changes in expression. Kind of the flip side of that is you have to recognize expressions across people, different people as well. So that here's a surprised face. Um, it's a studied face. And then you have to pick the, the face that matches it in the same emotion. And uh, I believe it's the, the boy in the middle. So um, that um, is the same sort of idea that you know being able to recognize that um, this person is happy and that person ha and, and this person's happy is a really important skill that we have. Um, and, and our results indicate that this is where kids um, have difficulty. We, we say that they have difficulty creating what we call abstract face uh, memory. So that is being able to generate a very sort of what we call robust representation, robust memory uh, in, in, in terms of identity. So here's, we'll say this person's Sean, but you're, you have to be able to recognize Sean when Sean's angry, when Sean's scared, when Sean's happy. So our results suggest that this is the kind of thing that kids on the spectrum uh, struggle with. And if you talk to parents if you, and, and teachers and EAs about you know, um, the kinds of deficits their kids might have, it seems like it's, it's these sorts of things. That is, um, if, a child, if a, a child makes a friend on the playground one day, he, he or she goes to school the next day and has problems remembering who that person is because maybe that person changed their clothes or has a little slightly different hairstyle. Um, this is actually not uh, 
um, uh, um, sort of a, a, a straightforward uh, process. Uh, similarly, um, we say that you have to have an abstract uh, representation of emotion or of expression. That is, here's Ju uh, Julie happy, Meg happy, or Billy happy. Um, we have to know in, in some ways that the, these, this is uh, examples of the, of the happy emotional state. These are the sorts of things that um, kids on the spectrum struggle with. And, and it probably might not be so surprising to um, uh, you because um, if we know, if, if we had to ca uh, uh, characterize the person, um, kind of the learning style of somebody on the spectrum, is that they're hy hyper specific learners, right? And, and that you know, they learn specific instances of a concept. And what's more difficult is then generalizing across these instances. So that's what you have to do when you, have, you, you when you were able to recognize uh, Sean when he's happy, scared, or angry. You have to sort of leave the his specific image aside of that emotion and be able to sort of see the the general properties of Sean in this case. That's one bit of information that we. Um, kind of derived from this battery. Um, then we also had a perceptual kinds of task. And what we did was we had what we call the same different task. It's a perceptual task. You're showing two faces side by side. And you just have to say simply whether they're the same or different. Now, um, what we did is we either changed the size of the eyes, the distance between the eyes, the size of the mouth, or the distance between the nose and the mouth. These faces are identical except for the size of the mouth. Um, this version of the face is a little bit, has a little bit bigger mouth than, than that version of the face. Um, so that's um, 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 a, an example of a different response. So you would say different on that, uh, that particular trial. Um, here's one where we change the distance between the eyes. So th these eyes are a little bit closer together than these eyes. So you can see what we're doing with this measure. We're, we're kind of probing the child's strategy when they look at a face or uh, are trying to uh, get at what, what they're attending to, what aspect of the face they're attending to. So this would be a different response as well. Now, of course, we had catch trials or catch items when so sometimes the faces were identical. The white bars are um, typically developing kids that are matched for age and IQ. Uh, gray bars are the um, kids on the spectrum. Um, and this is percent correct. So the higher the bar, the better they did. Uh, so these are, uh, on the left, configural eyes and feature eyes. So configural eyes when we change the distance between the eyes, feature eyes when we change the size. Here, what you can see is that on the, when, we, when we did those kinds of manipulations, that's where kids on the, uh, on the spectrum did more poorly than typically developing kids. Um, but notice, if we change the size of the mouth or the distance between the nose and the mouth, kids on the spectrum did just as well as uh, typically developing kids. So again, this tells us, you know, again, and you're kind of this sort of making, building an argument that, that uh, kids on the spectrum might have this eye, eye deficit. Um, but not a mouth deficit. So it's probably not completely accurate to say kids on the spectrum have a face deficit. It's probably more accurate to say they have kind of eye processing deficit. Now you might say, well, you know, is this something that's uh, kind of a general perceptual deficit? Maybe just a general bias or something? Maybe they have problems you know, attending to two things or what have you. And so we did a version um, of this task uh, with houses. So here we had a house, we had these two small windows and a sort of and a big window. And so we could sort of manipulate the um, size of the, uh, and the distances uh, between those elements. So here the big window is, the, sorry, this big window is a little bit bigger in the house on the right than the one on the left. Um, we could we have a version of this of so we have these two small windows and we can change the distances between them and um, so all the manipulations we did with faces we can um, uh, repeat with houses.
to see whether or not, you know, is, is this a, is something perceptual going on. In fact, something perceptual was going on. Uh, now, when you, it's the same kind of task, but now you change the stimuli that houses kids on the spectrum are actually per, outperforming the age and IQ matched um, control. So that, you know, this is a, 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 um, a good evidence that um, uh, that uh, kids on the spectrum have this sort of very uh, kind of perceptual uh, a, a attention to detail. So this is really good. You know, we're always looking for um, evidence for to support more of a difference model in autism than a deficit model. I, I just can't say enough about t taking this approach because it, it really does change your perspective of autism when you start thinking about just differences in cognition. And one of the really interesting challenges I think all um, um, universities now are facing is this, this new cohort of, of students um, who are now coming to the university who are on the spectrum and how, how are universities going to respond. I think that the difference model is, is a really good approach. So there are perceptual strengths as well as weakness in autism. Here's another great example. Uh, this is what's called the embedded figures task. So um, uh, when you, you're given an object here and you have to find this kind of shape or this object in this very complex geometric array, um, and it turns out that you know individuals with autism uh, again do pretty well on this, um, um, either as well or better than um, typically developing people. So that's where it was embedded. This kind of skill is really important for people who work at airport screening, you know TSA folks. Uh, people on the spectrum are as good as as typically developing individuals. Um, but one of the things is, um, that might give the advantage to people on the spectrum is that they're very focused, so they tend not to get fatigued looking at the screen. I mean, you know, you know, so they can stay on task maybe longer than um, um, neurotypical individuals. Can we train up face recognition as a form of expertise? Because um, in our lab, um, again, we've done quite a bit of this. Um, we, we've trained up people to be a bird expert. We've trained up people to be car experts. Um, um, we actually trained up people. There's this effect called the other race effect. So it's, it really is true that we have difficulties recognizing people of the other race. So we've actually, we have a training protocol that helps you recognize people from the other race. Or, or the, I shouldn't say, it's not necessarily the other race. It's the race that you have less experience with. But anyway, so there's these, tra you know, these training protocols that you can actually put into place that help train up face processing or, ex or perceptual expertise. So that's what we did. This was the sort of, uh, early work that um, we did with, uh, again, with the Yale people and Bob Schultz. We developed this program called Let's Face It. It's computer-based um, uh, intervention in face perception and recognition. Um, <clears throat> Uh, it's definitely science and evidence based because all of this came out of our labs. So everything that we sort of built into, let's face it, um, <clears throat> is is it's well grounded in our sort of understanding of how we recognize faces based on the empirical literature. Uh, we had different games uh, uh, that emphasized eye gaze, recognition of identity and expression. Um, and we, we developed this as an intervention, but of course, um, we actually found ourselves in the video game um, business, because if you're gonna develop these, um, this intervention, you have to make it fun. So we spent a lot of time trying to figure out, well, what makes something fun? And, and this is you know, brand new territory for us. We didn't have very much experience other than some of the people on the programming team had played video games, but you know, we didn't have a lot of experience uh, designing them. So we tried to make it fun because that's actually not, it turns out to be 99.9% .9 of whether an intervention is successful. So uh, here's a little snippet of what, 
So here's find a face. Basically, you have faces embedded in a complex uh, scene, and you have to click on it. It gets progressively harder, so there are many levels to these. Here's um, I spy. You click on the face that's making eye contact with you. So again, different levels, and you get a score. Um, here's a uh, just kind of a memory game. You have to match. This, these are identical faces, but you can imagine the same person with changes in perspective. Here you have to splash on particular emotion. This is zap it. You have to um, get three in a row and then the tokens disappear. Okay. So that was our sort of venture into the video game market. And we actually learned a lot about um, coming up with the right music and also the right feedback sounds. It turns out that was a real challenge. You know, the, sometimes kids would perseverate on that buzzer sound, so sometimes we'd have to change that to like a more neutral. So we developed this uh, um, um, and, and did a, a randomized clinical trial um, again um, with the Yale Child Study Center, where they have uh, access to large uh, populations of kids on the spectrum. Uh, so we, we, we gave this battery before the intervention, and then um, we sent, uh, we um, had 42 uh, uh, children uh, download Let's Face It and, and played it for uh, 20 hours. Then we had a wait list control. Mm -hmm. Uh, in this case, didn't do anything. So this was a pure computer-based intervention. So the kids, um, they played the games for 20 hours, but there was no one-to-one -one time with an interventionist. It was actually pretty, it was interesting because, the, the, because it was computer-based, um, the, the, the parents would, would send us a, the log file. So every mouse click is being recorded as the child does this. And they were, they were, they were sending the files to us in Victoria where the actual intervention was happening in um, New Haven in, in the States. But we could, over the, we would get it on Friday, on the weekends we'd process the, so we, we it, it was terrific for compliance. You could see exactly what games the kids were playing, how long, what their performance was. So lots of benefits from these computer things. Um, and then, oh, we could, so we could, you know, analyze the log files and then give feedback to the, the parents. And actually, we, there were case workers that were in, um, um, in New Haven who would kind of um, just remind the parents to have their kids play, let's face it. So that was, a, that was a, a, an important aspect of computer-based interventions. It um, was nice. Okay, so then we did, um, you know, time one, and then after the 20 hours, they did the post-test. We were hoping to get improvement across all those measures, but it was really kind of limited. And the one uh, measure we got the biggest improvement is what we call holistic processing. One of the really critical aspects of recognizing a face is we tend not to look at the individual features of a face. We tend to look at the total gestalt of the face. That is, how those faces, how those features interact. We had a test of that. Uh, this is called the part whole test. So you're given a study face, and I, again, I apologize for the video quality here, but you're given this face, and then that you're asked to study it, and then it goes away. And then you are uh, shown uh, what we call a part test, and so it's really impossible to see. It's, these are two eyes, one, um, and one of the pair of eyes belonged to the person you saw, and one of them didn't. Um, but these eyes are in isolation, right? This is just the parts part. It's really, you know, it's not so easy to do it this way. Why? Because when we look at a face, we don't analyze the individual parts of a face. We look at the whole face. Now, if I reinstate those eyes into the whole face, and that's what this whole face test item is. So now these are exactly the same two sets of eyes, but um, put in the entire face. It's much easier to recognize the person. And the reason why is because when we create a face memory, it's more this kind of holistic memory. 
And this is, in fact, um, after playing Let's Face, and it's really an important part of face recognition. And this is where the kids on the spectrum improve. Uh, the white bars is time one before the intervention, and the gray bars is afterwards. And they got better with the eyes, and actually got better uh, a little bit with the mouth as well. Anyway, so this was sort of the, you know, it was a lot of work for this particular result, but, um, you know, we, we felt we were on the, the right track. Um, the nice thing about doing the uh, clinical trial is that uh, now that it's over and we had this piece of software, we could make it available to folks. So um, if, um, if you're interested, um, you can just go to our website or Google Let's Face It Autism. We'll probably take you here and then you can just download it for free. And um, <clears throat> um, we're, it's quickly becoming obsolete though because you have all these changing operating systems. It, it's pretty stable for Windows machines, but Apple changed its operating system uh, um, uh, about a year ago and so it if you have an older Apple operating system, if, uh, I think it was Snow Leopards, it will still work, but then the, more new, the newer versions, it will. But anyway, you can go to the website and download it for free. I mean, that's another great thing about computer-based interventions is the, um, the distribution side. That is, you can make it available to the whole world. You know, we, we put a lot of work into, <laughs> into making these video games, and so we, we would, you know, it would be great if people use them. And actually, the people who download it, you know, we, they enjoy it. So that's if you're doing autism work, this is exactly the, the the main challenge, right? That is, if you develop an intervention. Um, <clears throat> Uh, to what extent does that even help a child on the spectrum? So even this let's face it game, let's say we got huge results on that battery, that still leaves open the, the, the important question, the critical question about external validity or just does, it, does this help the child? I mean, we'd get lots of anecdotal reports from moms and dads saying, oh yeah, you know, Johnny played let's face it and all of a sudden he was making all kinds of friends and blah, blah, blah. You know, and quite honestly, back then, we didn't, you would say, well, why didn't you build in some social measures? And we should have, but uh, we didn't. Um, um, that would have been the good thing to do. But I actually, I'm, I'm, I'm skeptical. I'm skeptical that, I mean, you can help people recognize faces, but that doesn't ensure that it's going to translate to the real world. Because if you, if you learn to recognize faces on a computer screen, you know, recognizing people in the real world is really kind of very different. Okay, but this is, we call this the small screen to big world problem of transfer and generalization. So it really kind of made us think about, you know, what sort of interventions might we want to develop. Um, and, and so we said, well, what we want to do is engage the kids uh, more directly. And so what I want to do is at least kind of show you some of the work we're, we've, we're doing now. Um, um, one of the things we know about people on the spectrum is they not only have difficulty recognizing expressions, they're also what we would call affectively flat. They have difficulty producing expressions or the kind of facial expressions they produce are ambiguous or um, dis what's called disorganized and uh, often not appropriate to the social context. Um, and also um, there's evidence to show that um, uh, people on the spectrum can mimic other people's expressions. So if you have a model in front of you, you can do what that person is doing. Uh, but they have difficulty posing an, an expression in the absence of a physical model or perceptual model. So posing is kind of an interesting task. When somebody tells you to smile for the camera, what you have to do is you have some representation of what a smile should be, and then that's what dr drives your motor production your, uh, of, of that expression. So you have to have some sort of uh, memory or, or, again, representation of that. And we actually use this a lot. This is kind of the more uh, conscious uh, aspect of, of um, social interactions that, I, I, you know, I, we use 
these conscious um, um, facial emotions to regulate our interactions all the time. If you go for a job interview or if you're at a party, you know, and, and there's um, different sort of um, sayings we hear in our culture like putting on a face or, um, um, or saving face. These are all th uh, kind of appeals to how we consciously control our facial expressions. I'll play this clip because this is a good example of how we do this. Okay, so here's Sheldon receiving a smiling lesson. Okay, so that's kind of an example of Sheldon getting a, a smiling, let's see, smiling uh, instructions. Um, and we can do this. We can kind of uh, uh, give people uh, verbal instructions on how to do different motor things, and in this case, making a facial expression. So... Um, at the Center for Autism Research, Technology, and Education, CART. Our motto is new tools for different minds. So we really like this idea of cognitive diversity. And to produce uh, accessible, low-cost, or free technologies for children with ASD. They're empirically and theoretically grounded in the cognitive brain sciences. So again, being drawn from our, the work that we do. Um, okay, so we've had the... the um, um, privilege to collaborate with uh, Marty Bartlett in the uh, Machine Perception Lab at the University of California, San Diego. So what is this software? It's, uh, it's a real-time um, expression recognition um, uh, platform. So basically what it does is it reads your face through the webcam, and then it can uh, <clears throat> isolate different muscles in your face and tell, uh, it gives a readout of different activation levels of these muscles. Uh, and why that's important is we know for certain facial expressions, it, it, uh, certain uh, facial uh, muscles are recruited. So, uh, for example, a smile is um, um, the, uh, um, what's called the zygomaticus muscle, the smiling muscle down here, so you get an upturn or increased activation. And, and those muscles combined with kind of the narrowing of the eyes, that's the obicularis oculi, so sometimes people talk about the genuine smile. That's, so we all can do this kind of uh, sort of Miss America smile, but the real smile is combined with kind of the twinkling of the eyes. So what we did is um, we took this idea uh, and... Um, I approached Marty and said, oh, well, can, you know, um, uh, we know kids on the spectrum have difficulty um, producing expressions. Can we somehow use this to develop uh, more inter interactive, engaging games? So where the user is actually providing the input to the game, so the user's face. So this is uh, the Smile Maze game in which uh, you have this little blue Pac-Man that you're navigating around the maze, and at certain points, your path is blocked. What you're trying to do is gather up these candies. At certain points, your path is blocked by these um, other um, yellow smiling icons. And the only way you can get rid of them is by smiling, so smiling into the camera. Um, and then you get some feedback by the smile meter on the left. So this is a way to practice your smile um, um, production. This is, uh, now this is CERT, okay? This is Marnie's program that uh, will um, look at your face in a webcam and dissect the different facial muscles. And so we'll look for the nose crinkle or the eye widening or the brown lowering or the lip corner pull and sort of tell, give us a readout of the activity of those different facial muscles. I mean, the nice thing about this program is that you don't have to have like super duper, you know, video setups. 
let's look at um, yeah. If you look at a, AU6, this is the uh, uh, my zygomaticus. So if I, I think it is. So if I sile, it goes up. Okay. So presumably it's, or maybe this is the one. It's being, it, it's responding to my my face. We can take that idea and, and import it into a game. So this is the face maze game. Um. Cancel. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay, let's see if this works. So I try to get candy. <laughs> okay, now smiling is usually pretty easy. It's harder is anger. So now it's going to look for my corrugator, my referral and bronze. Okay, and you know, usually, I mean, we don't practice being angry unless you're a first grade teacher or something. But uh, so, and 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 this was trained up on. I think Marnie had like hundreds of people come into lab and kind of train up this. And then the next level is you can see. I'll just do a couple. It's you can do surprise and. Okay, so that, that gives you an idea of what, um, what this is all. And, and again, what's impressive about this platform is that it works you know, on, on a Mac. And you know, it, so that means it, it's um, potentially or it, it, um, portable. And what we did was um, thus uh, playing uh, face maze improved the quality of facial productions. We had 20 kids on the spectrum, 7 to 16 years old. That you, you, we just had kids show us their, their um, happy face and their angry face prior to the intervention. And then we recorded that. So we had them pose their expression. Uh, and then we had uh, happy or angry, and then we had the control condition of su surprise. That was pre-training. Then they, they played either smile maze or angry maze, and then if, um, then we had them do the post-training uh, expression. So they only it only paid five minutes of this. Okay. So then what we did is we you, you know you take these videos and then you 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 kind of mix them up. <laughs> And you show them to naive raiders, and the naive raiders say, you know, are looking at these videos and rating the quality of the. the and and what they're doing, you'll you'll see in a moment, they have to rate the quality of um, in terms of all the expressions. So even though they're posing happy, they're saying, how much of this is happy? How much of this is surprised? How much of this is disgust? So forth and so on. Um, and we think that's important because what you'll see, so the darker, you know, the, the lighter bars are before the intervention. So remember, the raiders have no idea whether this was a pre or post uh, um, uh, video. The happy was rated higher in quality, okay? And that, because um, they, obviously they were doing happy, so that's going to be the highest uh, rated expression. But we also found that there was even a, a slight increase in surprise, so that post-production post-intervention production was had a little bit more surprise in it according to these naive raters. And that's not so surprising because um, that when we make a happy expression, there's a bit of surprise in it. And here's uh, after angry, uh, what you see here is, you know, the angry is rated better. Um, and we see, oops, you can't see, decreases I think in, um, forget what this was, um, surprise and some other expressions, but kind of, uh, increase in disgust. So again, anger and disgust are 
somewhat related in terms of their facial expressions. And we're actually doing some more clinical trials um, um, with um, gracious funding from Autism Speaks to sort of to look at this, to do this on a kind of larger um, um, kind of uh, scale. Um, the other um, kind of area of research that we're getting involved in um, is um, looking at friendships patterns in kids with um, ASD. Or we're, we're interested in this because this, again, is, seems to be a fairly um, essential aspect of, um, of uh, <clears throat> the social world of a child um, on the spectrum. And Connie Kasari's done some really great work kind of looking at uh, friendship patterns and loneliness in autism. And um, friendship is defined as the intimate relationship providing companionship, mutual support, and affection. So that's uh, just a working definition of um, friendship. Loneliness is the undesirable feeling associated with negative affect, heavy dependent on peer influences. So uh, there's a distinction between loneliness and just simply being alone. Um, <clears throat> Uh, social cognitive loneliness gives rise to feelings of exclusion, meaningless, marginality, and boredom. A lot of uh, Connie's work has shown that uh, kids on the spectrum report being lonelier and having fewer friendships than their TD counterparts. So loneliness is really sort of, uh, uh, a self-reflection. So I, I think there was some controversy whether kids on the spectrum could be have feelings of loneliness if they don't have, you know, a, a sense of self. But they, there's a real sort of genuine feeling of, of, of being kind of lonely and not uh, in a social group amongst children on, on the spectrum. I, I, I throw this up there only because I think this is a really neat way to uh, quantify uh, um, friendships and relationships in a social environment. So, and it's, it's kind of um, hopefully related to this app I'm going to show you. Um, <clears throat> so what you can do, you can go into a classroom and you can ask people, okay, who are your friends? Who do you hang out with? And they'll list people. And you kind of do this for everybody. And then in, just like in Facebook, you can develop these social, you know, kind of a social uh, metric. Uh, sociograms, I think they call them. And so you can see who's connected to who. who, who and, and, and whether those connections are reciprocal. You can generate these networks, and it's an interesting way to sort of see um, how that might work. Uh, can we um, use real world, uh, or can we enhance real world social networks of children with autism through mobile apps? I think the autism community is very, very excited about you know mobile apps, iPads, Android devices for a number of reasons. Um, I think the uh, immediacy of touchpad screens is a real big boost for kids, especially kids on the spectrum. I don't know. When we did the original Let's Face It, the one I showed you at the beginning, it's still cursor driven. And actually, I don't know if this is your guys' experience, but actually that's a fairly advanced idea. That is, if you don't know anything about computers, you know, making a movement here controls this thing up here that if I click there, it changes that state. That's a very, you know, when you think about sort of notions of what psychologists call contiguity, that is the causal connection between things, it's a fairly abstract idea. So what we wanted to do was um, kind of take some of the ideas of kind of the original, let's face it, some of those um, exercises, but now kind of uh, bridge the small screen and big world by bringing the big world into the small screen. Our goal is to develop apps with what we call um, player-based content. You know, nobody cares about learning the faces in some program like, let's face it, that the, you know, these faces that the computer programmer put in his or her game as content. We, we want to develop games where the user gets to determine the content, and their content is from people from their own real world lives. Um, so, um, 
So I, I took a couple snapshots of me, um, but but now you guys know kind of uh, what, what's going on here. So it's it's fairly easy, and I'll show you in a second uh, to import content into these games, and it's pretty easy to label them, and and this would help, and 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 then you can label multiple images with the same tag, right? Because what you want to do is develop that robust representation of a person. So here I am, this was me last year in Florida at a conference. This is me two days ago. And then this is me, actually there's something called um, hair salon app or something. <laughs> you can take your face and do <laughs> strange things to it. The other thing um, that um, we can do with the app is, is not only have uh, static pictures, so there's me static, um, but also dynamic. So there's me dynamic. So this is a two second uh, clip that loops back and forth. And um, I didn't talk about the literature, but we know that dynamics are really important for not only facial expressions. Obviously, I mean, that, that's also been a kind of a, a problem with the facial expression literature. It's these static faces people are writing. But facial expressions are dynamic, not so dynamic as this. But, um, <laughs> this is just weird. Um, but, um, but it has this dynamic. So you get this two-second snippet, and it, 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 it loops back and forth. So, what we did was, uh, this is, you know, this is the nerdy part. Um, we, you take it forward and then you just simply reverse it. So it's not like um, on Vine or um, um, where you kind of get, it kind of goes to the beginning and it jumps and starts that way. So we wanted more continuous movement. So that's what this is. Um, uh, um, the other nice thing is, um, you can take, um, this is, uh, we have a camera that works on this and that you can, basically I just held it up to my uh, laptop screen. This is uh, Emma Watson off a of YouTube um, <clears throat> video. So, I mean, the quality doesn't have to be great and that's actually an important aspect of face recognition is that we're, we're able to recognize people under like low lighting, you know, very impoverished uh, visual um, environment. So, but there's something, what, what I really like about this is that um, we get a lot of information about who somebody is by their, their movements. So it's all those kind of distinctive ticks and the way we carry our head that tells us that, that who we are and actually as observers we pick up on that. I mean, I'm sure you all, you know, you see this in families, right? Everybody has a certain way, you know, and these things are um, uh, non-accidental and they're actually really good cues to identity. Um, okay, so here I am under on, on different images. I can, you know, not uh, take cartoon characters. I can take, it's not just uh, faces, I can do um, objects, um, but um, uh, we can, you just take a lot of these images from your camera roll. So before the talk, I took a picture of Pat. Okay, so there's Pat. Okay, nice, that's a nice picture, of you, Pat. I say click, yeah. I want to keep. So now you're in the UBC demo album, and um, we put a lot of work and time into it because you know it's easy to take pictures, as we all. It's really hard to and label and categorize them. And here, it's pretty easy to label these things. So there's Pat. Okay. Now. Um, so one of the things I can do, because we know we get lots of information from a face. Not only do we get their identity, but we get the emotion of a face. So I'll put you in the, and, and so now, um, if this works, this is all still beta, I'll put you in the demo album. Pat, let's see if you're there. Oops. There you are. Okay, there's Pat again, but instead of Pat, um, Pat, Pat. 
that I can label her as happy, right? So you, if I had an album called Expressions, um, it would work. Okay, so let's go back to the UBC demo. Oh, but now you're, oh, that's a bug. It should be, you could be Pat in one album and it's happy in another. Here. Yeah, oh, that's good to know. You'll be called happy for this demo. Okay. Is that okay. all right? Okay, so there you are, happy. So we actually are learning, you know, we're, we very much are a fan of errorless learning. Uh, so you get, you get a face and uh, you have to click on it because we also know um, actually making the motor movement and saying, oh, okay, reinforces the concept. Um, we used to have a version where you just kind of got a preview, but no, you have to make a motor act. To re so there I am. I'm, that's not happy, it's Jim. So I do that. There's happy again. And there's happy again. So we haven't built in smart learning yet. There's all kinds of what's called optimized learning algorithms to, and you guys probably know more about it than I do. Um, but we're, we're kind of, once we get the bugs out, <laughs> we're going to start Constraint. So there's mug, okay, and then there's happy again. What happens if you hit the wrong one? Oh, okay. So that's mug. You just get a red thing. Right. We, ha you know, we actually haven't put music in. We haven't put feedback. There's lots of, you know, we haven't put the the bells and whistles on this yet. Uh, but again, you get some uh, motion information, um, you know, and it just kind of works your way up. Um, and at, if you hit certain criteria, then you get uh, you add uh, a new new face to it or a new new person. So you can see that it's this is um, again trying to get at this idea of creating a fairly robust representation of not only a, a person's identity because if so if you saw enough examples of like of me, eventually you'd start learning me and you. You learn, uh, that's why we have names, because we have a specific proper name that is linked to that particular uh, representation. Um, and then um, one of the things that we're um, also building in is some metrics so that it tells us you know, how, um, how we're doing in terms of how correct we are. Um, let's see if this part works. This is all new stuff. Um, there are three, so in parentheses are the number of um, kind of examples of each one. There's three examples of me. So um, you can see here when I was the funny face, I was, was 100 percent. When it was the motion, I was 100 percent. But when I was this, I was only 87 percent. So you can sort of track. Well, you can't. You can track. Uh, uh, performance and the other thing we're building in is reaction time as well. So the the assumption is the faster you are, the more uh, the faster, more accurate you are, the the better. Actually, I'm going to use this in my methods class. It's about 100 students. It's just a really great way to learn people's names. One of the things we're really interested in because we think now if you give one of these devices to each kid, and let's say it was in a classroom. Um, and they can take pictures of their other friends. You, you, you have, you know, th that's data that tells you who, you know, they can, who they hang out with, and and um, I think we can begin to kind of uh, get some metrics. But also, I think um, there's, you know, there's a lot of cognitive science here. There's um, the idea is that you can create your own categories too, right? So. And it'd be really interesting to see what kind of categories kids on the spectrum, or just anybody, would create. I mean, it becomes you know, um, um, a way to kind of reveal um, <clears throat> what, um, uh, how somebody structures their everyday life. And um, yeah, so so that's 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 what we're up to. Mm -hmm.